Good morning. My name is Erin and I'm a member of the Young Adults Community Group and the Misty Way Community Group. This morning's reading is from Judges 4 through 5, verses 7. After Ehud's death, the Israelites again did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord turned them over to King Jabin of Hazor, a Canaanite king. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived, who lived in Herosheth Hagoyim. Sisera, who had 900 iron chariots, ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. Deborah, the wife of Lapidoth, was a prophet who was judging Israel at the time. She would sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites would go to her for judgment. One day she sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, who lived in Kadesh in the land of Naphtali. She said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Call out 10,000 warriors from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun at Mount Tabor. And I will call out Sisera, commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors, to the Kishon River. There I will give you victory over him. Barak told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. Very well, she replied. I will go with you, but you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. At Kadesh, Barak called together the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 warriors went up with him. Deborah also went with him. Now Heber the Kenite, a descendant of Moses' brother-in-law, Hobab, had moved away from the other members of his tribe and pitched his tent by the oak of Zenanaim near Kadesh. When Sisera was told that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, he called for all 900 of his iron chariots and all of his warriors, and they marched from Harush of Hagoyim to the Kishon River. Then Deborah said to Barak, get ready. This is the day the Lord will give you victory over Sisera, for the Lord is marching ahead of you. So Barak led his 10,000 warriors down the slopes of Mount Tabor into battle. When Barak attacked, the Lord threw Sisera and all his chariots and warriors into a panic. Sisera leaped down from his chariot and escaped on foot. Then Barak chased the chariots and the enemy army all the way to Harish of Hagoyim, killing all of Sisera's warriors. Not a single one was left alive. Meanwhile, Sisera ran to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, because Heber's family was on friendly terms with the king, Jabin of Hazor. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come into my tent, sir. Come in. Don't be afraid. So he went into her tent and she covered him with a blanket. Please give me some water, he said. I'm thirsty. So she gave him some milk from a leather bag and covered him again. Stand at the door of the tent, he told her. If anybody comes and asks you if there is anyone here, say no. But when Sister fell asleep from exhaustion, Jael quietly crept up to him with a hammer and tent peg in her hand. Then she drove the tent peg through his temple and into the ground, and so he died. When Barak came looking for Sisera, Jael went out to meet him. She said, come, and I will show you the man you are looking for. So he followed her into the tent and found Sisera lying there dead with the tent peg through his temple. So on that day, Israel saw God defeat Jabin, the Canaanite king. And from that time on, is oh, excuse me, and from that time on, Israel became stronger and stronger against King Jabin until they finally destroyed him. On that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang this song. Israel's leaders took charge, and the people gladly followed. Praise the Lord. Listen, you kings. Pay attention, you mighty rulers. For I will sing to the Lord. I will make music to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you set out from Seir and marched across the fields of Edom, the earth trembled, and the cloudy skies poured down rain. The mountains quaked in the presence of the Lord, the God of Mount Sinai, in the presence of the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, and in the days of Jael, people avoided the main roads, and travelers stayed on winding pathways. There were few people left in the villages of Israel until Deborah arose as a mother for Israel. This is the word of the Lord.
Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. <clears throat> and uh, I'm Howard Brown, the pastor here at Christ Central Church. And um, we're going to look at a passage in Judges. As we've just read through it. In this time in Bible history, um, God used militarized action to reveal himself and his ministry, not only to his people, but the world around them. Right? The leaders of these divine military efforts were called, as the book says, judges, endowed with special and unique gifts and abilities. Sometimes they're on, sometimes they're off. But that made them good for the task at hand. But they were more like Batman than Superman, right? They were more like Watchmen than X-Men. I'm sorry if you're not in the comic world, you don't get it. <laughs> they were more like Kanye than Jay-Z. You know? Really gifted, but you don't know what you're going to get. Read Judges. You'll see what I mean. But the Lord God himself allowed these often extra special and extra broken men and women to be used for the work of God. To after it was said and all done, left them and now you and me hoping and longing and trusting God for a true and final and perfect hero to save us. There's no story in Judges that is more important in remembering these things if we are to get the gospel message from God than this one about the judge Deborah. Or as my late grandma, grandmama, mother, first lady Gertrude Fraser pronounced it, Deborah. Um, well, she was halfway right. It's actually Deborah in the Hebrew, not Deborah, right? But uh, I believe the message of Deborah and then jail has been burdened and lost oftentimes by theological and gender role debates that loom in Christendom. You know, whenever there's a debate about women's roles and place in the church, you know, oftentimes folk have to qualify or extra qualify Deborah being a prophet and leader and then jail a killer of a man who gets warrior level glory for taking down an evil general. Let me make it plain Deborah was a prophet. A prophet, which meant she spoke the word of God for and to the people of God. She was a Civil, civic, right? A civil authority and spiritual leader of God's people. And then jail, <laughs> back to Marvel Comics, right? She was a black widowish undercover super soldier, right? But here's the irony though their womanness joined with our misogyny and often misogyny and cultural and preconceived notions about women and mothers has everything to do with getting this story. Everything to do with getting God's message in this story and it getting to us. They, this story, this passage is a picture, a, a lesson on power, the potency, the fine quality, precision, and character of God's grace. A mother load, if you will, of God's grace. In three ways we will see today. First, that God's grace hears and speaks to us. I think I changed that from what you have. Oh, no, it's close. Okay. Secondly, God's grace goes with us. And finally, God's grace comes for us. Hears and speaks to us, number one. Uh, goes with us and finally comes for us. No, doing, it does for us. Right. God's grace does for us. Okay. We are set up for the lesson that we're going to learn by the very introduction of Deborah. So the writer of the book of Judges in the way he introduces the story wants us to feel curious about this. 
Because this was a provoking, right? As provoking, rather, then as it still can be today. The text reads something like this. Israel, God's people, went evil. And God allowed a superpower to arise to potentially crush, crush and oppress oppressed them. It, 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 they came with a 900 chariot military setup led by a man's man, Caesarea. And there should be this ooh in the room. And Israel cries to God for help. And the next line, Deborah, <laughs> the wife of Lepidoth. And let me tell you, there are about three or four ways to interpret, but it is saying the enemy, the oppressor, was led by one bad, shut your mouth, right? And Israel had somebody's mama, somebody's wife, a woman leading it. And the text goes on to say that she held court under a palm of Deborah. Uh, of Deborah. And, and the writer wants us to think, we in trouble, y'all. This is not looking too good. They have 900 chariots and we have Judge Judy. <laughs> or Mother Mercy telling fortunes online. What is God thinking? Well, we must fall in line with the constant theme in Judges. God this time, again, somehow in Deborah, has sent his help. But we can miss the glory of this thing because of Deborah's matronliness, right? But we should not think, man, what is wrong or twisted about this? Like the Israelites thought when they compared leaders. There, there is no comparison. We should not be looking at the chariots and saying, oh, no. But we should be re-looking at Deborah and saying, bring it on. Why? She is a prophet and judge, which means through her, the concerns of people come to God, and then the word of God comes out of her mouth for them. She means, grace means, God hears and speaks to us. Look at how it unfolds here in verse 3. It says here, Sisera, who had 900 iron chariots, ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, Deborah, the wife of Lipidoth was a prophet who was judging Israel at the time. So you've got these very intimidating forces in the enemy that speak their own strength out loud. It's a message, a picture, a, a picture lesson of brute strength of, of you're going to die, right? You, you're going to get the gangster beat down. You and, in this case, your mama, right? And Deborah is God having listened and heard and then speaking with the word. First a calling from heaven to get Barak, an army commander, and then to get him, get him direction and guidance and hope in the face of adversity. Look with me again at verse 7. It says here, And I will call out Sesera. This is Deborah speaking commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors, to the Kishon River. There I will give you victory over him. It says, I will call out, right? I will, the word there is also lore. I is not Deborah here. No, Deborah isn't planning to leave her palm tree. She is saying, I, God. There, this is God speaking to you, Barak, against and for the enemy around you and for the enemy of fear in you. So you think about the opposing army strength. It is the words of God through Deborah that have now become Barak's chariots and war plan against this formidable foe. It is as strong and sure as the most powerful sword because of Deborah's authority to speak it, combined by the fact that she hears from God and God has heard his people that it is God's word that she speaks. God's unseen mouth is incarnated by Deborah's real presence, and it should have become a reality, a reality that Barak could go in and move in and trust in and lead his people. And it is God's grace, God listening and speaking to us through Deborah to Barak against the enemy. I remember 
I wasn't under a tree, but for me, it was a kitchen table, right? Laying all the school day or whatever time in my life it was or the week's issues right there at our kitchen table in Charleston before Mama, the one who led me to the Lord, the woman who discipled me as she cooked, right? And others would come to that table. Sometimes I'd come in the house and I'd be like, what is going on? Mama is under the palm tree again. Young people and old people. Sometimes my aunt would come over early on Saturday morning, come down, and they they eating fish and grits and shrimp, just, just a little something, and talking deeply, hearing each other and sharing the Word of God. And just on this day for you, mothers and women who are in mothering roles, you have these callings. And spaces if you have the word of God in your life. If God is living in you for the good of God's people, you have the calling to intercede, to listen, to pray, to speak God's word with wisdom. And in this case, with power, given God's word, power enough to deal with the enemies, anyone who comes with you or your children are dealing with in this world. To give those you love God's confidence and promise beyond your limited abilities. God's grace is coming and speaking to our lives today, comes through story and beauty and romance and insightfulness and welcome and, 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 and care for the heart and mind. It is strong in its love and communication and feeds us with truth. It does not come, though, always looking alluring or looking buff and, and flexing. It is, it is in its being God's word, all by itself powerful in its purposes and plans, and it is sure and it is right. Judge, prophet, Deborah's story tells and teaches us something about grace. The grace of God and giving of his word comes in weak packages. Or what we consider weak packages. And means and in his giving, like the Bible, right? Just look at this thing. And people up here crazy enough to preach and teach it. Or sit at a kitchen table and tell you what God says. Not all the time or mostly not. It doesn't come all the time and mostly it doesn't come with lights and smoke and cannons shooting off. But as we call it, God's ordinary means of grace. It is just that. Ordinary as a kitchen table with a mama cooking some chicken. But as she communicates God's word, hey, look, y'all, sometimes (laughs) mamas, yeah, this message more for y'all today because it's Mother's Day. Sometimes it is in the van, driving to school, right? God's word speaking to you gives strength to your covenant children. And if you don't have children, you, a mother of many, right? The Bible calls um, Deborah the mother of Israel. She didn't have all those children, but she was because she was a woman who spoke truth and heard God and heard people's uh, issues and concerns. And, and she meant God is hearing you, right? And she took those concerns and she interceded for them. And there's lots of enemies out there. Lots too big. And Barak, the presence of the prophet, the presence of the word of God, y'all thinks about those chariots and Sisera and his own abilities. And he goes off to war like a man. Is that what your Bible says? (laughs) No. He looks at those chariots. He looks at Sisera and he looks at his abilities and obviously still feeling insecure and inadequate says, God hearing and speaking, that's a good start. But Deborah, will you go with me? (laughs) Okay, understand. Women did not go to war back then, right? We saw that. Jail's hanging out in the tent, right? She making milk, whatever. Now, 
someone still recovering from toxic masculinity. I will spare you the hundred derogatory ways and terms I could use to talk about what kind of man Barack is. Just put it this way. When he said, will you go with me? Couldn't you see his dads and brothers and family drop their heads? <sighs> Barack, the general, yes, we're going. Can, can you go with me? probably thinking, not my son. And we are tempted to say, he's not a real man of God. Real men step up. All that foolish Christian toxic masculinity, it's opposite to the way we're supposed to receive the grace of God. Lead with strength and God confidence. Be the man. Lead. Will you go with me? Huh? Here's the deal. If we're putting down Barack as a weak man, I got good news for your, I got news rather, for your understanding of the Bible, of the God of the Bible. Barack is a kind of man, the kind of person, the kind of people, not only where God's grace listens and speaks and comes to, but actually goes with. Look at verse 8 and 9 here. Barack says, Barack told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. Very well, she replied, I will go with you, but you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Caesarea will be at the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. You know what he's saying? Again, the law, the word, you saying everything is good, just do it. In this fallen world, is not enough. I need divine companionship. I need divine community in the details. The live action of my life of all you said was going to happen. I need something in there. I need to see God. I need to be able to look to a God who is there. When I am in there, I need you, Deborah, to be God's presence with me. And Barack should have been honored. Should be honored. And he is later, right? For what we in our own self-reliant, proud John Wayne, Lone Ranger heart failed to do, unlike Cicero, Barack wants and needs and must in his weakness get God's victory for his life. He needs the assurance of God's presence more than he needs the glory or the honor. He admits and leads with weakness, unlike the enemies of God in the other army do with their strength. He is saying, I don't have the faith, the power, the ability to hold the truths of God without a living presence of God going with me. But God's grace going with Barak has a serious consequence, doesn't it? Deborah says, I'm sorry, you won't get the honor. A woman will get the honor of the victory and not you. Because if a woman wins a war, Barack, no Heisman for you. Your jersey will not get retired. No book deal. The guys won't all want to be like you. You will not be a man's man. You will not get picked. In the five, at the pickup game, you get picked last. Oh, okay, I'll take Barack, right? Or just picked on. Like some pastors and preachers will in this text. A woman got the victory. You knew things were bad in Israel. Things must have really been bad back then because God had to use a woman because a man couldn't step up. Just a bad interpretation of the scripture. I remember I was getting my football gear when I played football. I was a little kid. I, I, I was in the band, y'all, okay? So. But I played football for a little while. And, uh, and in Charleston, we had to get the, go to this place. And they didn't have all the equipment downstairs. So they were like, hey, we go up to the attic because that's where we store things. Come on up and get your stuff. Come on, young man. And I was like, am I going up there? Mama? can you go with me? And she was like, son, yes, please, mama. And she went with me, and we got up there, and the worst thing, another salesman was having another dude, and she was like, see, he ain't got his mama up there. And I was like, I don't care. I'm glad to have you. I, I mean, I don't know that man. I was fine. Good for him. I got my mama with me. Ain't nobody doing nothing wrong to me in the attic. Or throw me out the window. Bad things happen in addicts, right? <laughs> and it appears that 
he would always, Barack would always be remembered as a weak mama's boy at first. But y'all, look more closely at verse 9 with me. Very well, Deborah replied, I will go with you, but you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. This is not the battle of the sexes. It is not a woman who wins over or instead, oh, you know, wins over instead of a man. It is, vic- it is the victory of who? The Lord. By the hands of a woman going and being with Barak. God has given us grace through his going and being with us through community and fellowship and friendship and discipline and discipleship, the goals of being a committed part of and body of believers. But think what that says. You cannot, Christianity's message and grace's message is you cannot and will not go it alone. You are weak in your saying no to certain sins. You can't win. You can't beat your own demons. You are a wimp and weakling against the ills and issues of the world inside of you and outside of you. You need prayer and conversations and confrontations to check yourself. You need God's invisible help for his Holy Spirit working in the visible offering of his community of faith. And if you ask and lead and go with God going with you and being with you, you will not get the glory or the honor or the praise, God alone in his grace will get the glory and the honor and the praise. Let me just say it. You and I can sometimes be the biggest haughty fools if we lead with strength. I can do it this in our marriages, in our relationships in our jobs, in our callings, in our schools, with our families. You know, I was looking at Genesis this week because I was going to preach something out of Genesis and decided not to. But God said it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make him a help meet. Right? And, and let's just take, the, the, let's just flatten um, man as, as being masculine, right? Let's just think about this. It is not good for humanity to be alone. Now, there's some more specific applications when it comes to marriage, but there is a general description. This is a general description of how God designed humanity. We will always need a help meet. You know, help meet means? It means shield. It means protector. It means the person who goes before you to clear things out, right? It is a safety, right? Uh, Like it, it protects your backside. It protects your side. It protects your left. This is a help meet. And what God is saying is his grace through the Holy Spirit manifest in what we see here in the body of Christ, in our marriages, in our friendships, in our all our relationships, in the body of Christ, God is providing a help. Meet for each one of us. And it's part of the character of God. Sometimes we go, help me, that's for the women. Help me is who God is in Scripture. Right? Because that's what you need. (laughs) So man, male, female, be weak. Be needy. Mothers, be weak. Be needy. You don't have to be strong on your own. Go ahead. It's okay to have pain, it's okay to hurt. You don't have to uphold it all in the whole family on your own. Yes, specifically, women, when she was made, God called her a help meet. But mothers, you who are help meets have a help meet. 
the grace of God calls you sinners, fallen, broken, deformed, afraid of your ability and failures to fix your life by your own handling of directions, and it doesn't work. Let the mothering help meet nature and character and strength of God's grace go with you. So Deborah goes with Barak to war, and then it happens just as she says. They are on a ridge, and chariots come out in strength. Right? And I could imagine, you know, based on where Israel is right now, almost everybody has a sword, right? <laughs> There's probably some, you know, farm equipment, some sporting equipment, you know, baseball bat or something on one side. Ain't nobody got any chariots. Maybe a couple people riding mules. We don't know. And you get this picture where Israel's weakness is all out there. It's not hidden. In the pauses, they're able to look over each. It is loud and clear. This is going to be a slaughter. Man. Sometimes I look at my children as some of you do, especially you mothers do. And then you look at the world. <laughs> and I'm feeling this more and more, and I'll talk about it in another sermon coming up, but I'm feeling it more and more as both of our boys are going to college this year. And I look at them, and I look at the world. <laughs> it's going to be a slaughter. That's what it feels like. Like, they're not equipped well enough. Right? And, and, you know, we have this rule in our house. Our boys are 18 and 20. Right? But um, they have a curfew. Not for them. For Kelly. <laughs> She's not going to sleep. So I told them, you come home for her because she got to sleep because she's carrying the vision you're out there a young black man driving a car around in this world it's a slaughter that's the visual we get that's the feeling we carry but the Bible says it rained. <laughs> it rained. And the river basin floor is now a death trap for the chariots. So much so that the irony, and this has happened a couple times in Scripture, their weight of their chariots, they get muddied down. And then the Bible says Israel throws them into a surprising confusion. You know why? They're so dependent on their chariots that when they get money down, they don't know how to fight without them. They're living in a pseudo strength. It's taken away. No, what do we do? Here come the people with the baseball bats. Throws them to a surprising confusion. And the Bible says they run and Israel runs them down. Kills every single one of them. But the Bible says Sisera, the great general, he must have got a head start. He flees. And he goes to the neighborhood of what he thinks is a friend. And hope, hoping and confidently, let's say arrogantly, he asked for hospitality. I say arrogantly asked because back then you didn't help ask for hospitality. Help from a neighbor. You would just sit out there and help from a town or a person in the town would come and call you in, right? In this ancient culture. But you never asked for it. So like a general, he asked, but he sort of commands. Jail. Again, somebody's wife, <laughs> somebody's mama, I'm guessing. When Barak, no, 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 when Sisera asked for water, the Bible says she gives him milk. She gives him something better than water. I'm going to give you milk, baby. I got you. And he asked for a place to rest, and she puts 100% Hungarian goose down comfort on him. And he lays on a monogrammed Egyptian cotton sheet. And then he asked this woman to be a lookout for him. Women don't go to war, I thought. Yeah. 
But I'm asking you to be a lookout because I'm feeling kind of sleepy. To do what he would ask a soldier, this brother, now with a Sunday after church, mama cooked a big meal slumber in a prideful, I am the man, she will do what I say. Makes the mistake a lot of brothers who didn't wake up the next day do. <laughs> he goes to sleep. Remember, we've had this conversation before. Don't go to sleep. I'm like, what happens if I do this to you, Kelly? Well, don't go to sleep. <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? Just don't go to sleep. Now I sleep with one eye open every night. I'm like, we had a fight today. I don't know, should I go to sleep? <laughs> I'm still here, y'all. God's grace. <laughs> and the Bible says, jail takes a tent peg. And hammers it through his temple and into the ground. Run translation says, she fastened his head to the ground. <laughs> I love that one because that's the kind of person I am. <laughs> the text says he was hammered to the ground through the temple. And then it has a pause. And he was dead. <laughs> it reminds me of Miss Sophie, played by Oprah Winfrey in the Color Purple movie. And one of the most famous soliloquies in black movie history says as she talks about not letting her husband physically abuse her, says, I'll kill him dead before I let him beat me. Cesara was killed dead. Now, I believe this is nothing short of a God divine order plan through this woman. She was not an Israel. I mean, Deborah even prophesied before, you're not going to get the victory. A woman's going to get the victory of killing Sisera. So she is in the prophecy, right? She is not, and she had every reason to be afraid of this mighty man and his strength. Let me tell you again, she hammered through his head and into the ground. This was one powerful swing. She couldn't just ease on it like I do when I'm afraid of hitting my thumb with, you kind of feather it, right, until it gets in far enough, then you hit it. No, she, because that would have woken him up. She had to swing with a force that took him out without waking him first. Pow! With accuracy and strength. Jail, a woman, a non-battle-proven woman, takes a non-weapon that would be overlooked like a hot pot of grits on the stove, or a cast iron skillet, or a waffle iron, or any of a planter box, any of those things that a woman can destroy a man with in one swoop. In her traditional roles, she took what she had and was as a woman and a mother, and God used that to take him out. She didn't even use a sword. I'm sure he was looking around to see if there's a sword or a shotgun in the house. God used all she was and wasn't to take out Israel's enemy. And has Barak come up late and she's like, here's your enemy. I, a woman, a mom, did it. But you win. In other words, Barak, you can wear my jersey. <laughs> you know, quite a reverse in roles, right? When you got your letterman's jacket, this back in the day, y'all, I know I'm old. But on a day of the game or whatever, on a Friday, the, gir the girlfriend be wearing the jacket. <laughs> hey, baby. Or your ring. We used to do the ring too, right? You give your girlfriend your ring. Hey, with the tape on it. I, mean, I love you. You be freezing. <laughs> Good, baby. Right? <laughs> no, Barack, you get to wear my Letterman's jacket. But the team on it is the Lord. I jail might have been used to do it, but I want you to see what God has done. Grace is that the Lord did it. He saved you from enemies and issues and problems that might have caused or been to you, that, that you may have been too afraid or ill-equipped to face, and you get to wear his jersey at the pep rally because grace is God doing for us. None of the stories of faith, nothing in the gospel, do you hear me? Nothing in this Bible allows me and you to wear 
our own jersey with our name on the back. To have our face on the back of the book of faith, nobody's face. To have our own line of greeting cards. To have our own t-shirts. To have our own NIL deal, name, image, likeness. The gospel says this, while we were yet sinners, meaning unable, fearful, unfaithful, jolly come lately, confused and blinded by sin and darkness, loving to do wrong, failures in fixing our own world and problems and relationships, God sent someone to take care of it for us. Grace is a story about how we didn't, wouldn't, couldn't, even in some cases shouldn't, but God by his grace did it anyhow despite us. I think about the whole message, and even in light of this being Mother's Day, it is often her being special because of what we see in ourselves and her children, biologically or not, right, biological or not. It is about what has been accomplished by God in your life and in our world through your mother oftentimes. That's why Deborah in chapter 5, that's why we celebrate Mother's Day. We don't celebrate Mother's Day just because of who she is. But look at you. You hear. God did that through her. Right? I, I wrote somebody who's not my mother. My mother been with the Lord a long time now, right? But I wrote somebody who's not my mom. Thank you for mothering me. Not just because you're an incredible woman, an incredible mother. Look at me. God did this through you. So Deborah, chapter 5, gets a song and sings a song about her. Barack and her sing a duet, I guess. Rick James and Tammy. Somebody like that. Love them and leave. No. I'm way too old for y'all. And then in verse 7 of that chapter, she's called a mother of Israel. God through her mothering, which means, you know what mothering? I looked it up. The bond of family. The very bond of community, the one who kind of holds things together, protecting and shielding and providing for, shows we must be brought, we must be shown, we must be granted, we must be blessed, we must be birthed apart from our ability into what the Lord has accomplished for you on your behalf, for the benefit of your soul, right? For your benefit by his strength, by his blood, by his grace for you. Come and get it for your good, but for his glory and by his doing. I want you to see see in Mother's Day and the whole of all Christianity that the gospel and message and the person and the power and the providence of God now in Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, the mother load of grace comes like it did through Deborah in jail. But socially, culturally, and sometimes humanly defined weakness. But as the gracious and powerful work and person of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is God mothering us. Let me say it again. Jesus is God not only brothering us, not only fathering, Mothering us. Like Deborah, he came as a mother, a living word. Jesus goes and stays with us, and like a housewife and woman jail, Jesus is the powerful but weakly package. But instead of hanging under a tree like Deborah, Jesus, in his violent work against our enemies, hangs on a tree. And on that cross, Jesus takes out the enemies of our soul, our sin, and does the work of making and calling us righteous before God. And in that, because of the grace of God in Christ, we can be blessed like Barak. As those who feel and felt like a motherless child, weak, alone, lacking comfort, needing strength and nurture, 
rejected because we're not everything we should have been, unsure, insecure, sinful, not knowing all and seeing all or having it all together, coming in a world that exploits and orphans and even bullies us, to come to a Savior who, like a mother, is sure to love and strong to hold who will never fail to come and speak to us and be with us and do for us. And we, like Barak does with Deborah in chapter 5, live with holy, humble confidence in this fallen world. And th- sorry, in chapter 4. And then, like chapter 5, not only first and foremost, praise her like we do on Mother's Day, <laughs> but praise God. Praise God for Jesus. Jesus is God mothering us. And as you see the reflection of that, not only your biological mom, but in women around who are used by God to do exactly what we see in this story, the Lord accomplishes victory in your life, oftentimes because of them. And it is a sad time in our society and oftentimes in our churches when we mistreat and misjudge them because we see them as weak or unable or giving in to every whim and every cry and every tear. Don't you want that from your Lord? Sometimes with Kelly, man, I'm like, leave them boys alone. Let them cry. They'll be all right. She's like, no. Come on in. And Howard, you, 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 put your hands on and pray for him now, right? Like, oh, gosh. Let them get tough and toughen up. Don't you want Jesus to be like a mom? I'm tired of being tough. I'm tired of running, y'all. Now that I'm 50, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of thinking I can beat a man. I need God to mother me. I just need to kind of fall down like my mama used to do. Hey, baby, you all right? Grace is God mothering us, y'all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for carrying us. Thank you for rebirthing us. Thank you for hearing our cries and our whines, just like you did in this Bible, this chapter. Renew us by reminding us we need that kind of grace. Don't strengthen us in our own strength. For the males in here, don't make us man up because it seems like the world demands it. But as your scripture says, let us be children of God. And in that, we will act. Lord, I pray for the mothers today biological mothers, spiritual mothers, community mothers, aunties who never had any children of their own, mothers, sisters that are like mothers to their nieces and nephews, Lord. Continue to use them. And for those who don't think they can be used, I pray that they would come to you and gain strength and possibly for some in here rebirth to be the kind of woman and mother that scripture strengthens and frees them to be. Not oppressively, not in a condemning way, 
not so they can be controlled and demeaned as less, but so they can be used as more than what we could possibly ask or think in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us take time to confess our sins today. And um, as you do, prepare yourself as you confess your sins for the need for God to hear and speak to you. Let your heart need someone to go with there with you. Let this confession prepare your heart to need the Lord to do something in you that you can't do for yourself. And then be embraced like you only can by a mother in the assurance. Let's say it together. I'll read the leader portion. Lord, your word calls us to offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God proclaiming our allegiance to his name, and don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. Your word also warns us to beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. Your word warns that doing such things brings no reward from our Father who is in heaven. Jesus read from the book of Isaiah in chapter 61. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom from the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Let's take time to personalize this. Please stand to your feet, children of God, and let us read, and as we read, hear these words that we're forgiven, that God calls you back to himself. Together, Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who, O oh Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I talked a lot about the sort of comforting feel of a mother, but there were two parts of the story, weren't there? There was also jail, <laughs> who did not hesitate to take out the person who was going to cause trouble, right? Right? And that is so true with mothers, right? They don't hesitate. If it looked like the children in trouble, you're done. No hesitation. And uh, when we think about that, as we come to the Lord's Supper, y'all, the Father 
intention, with intentionality. Christ, the Bible says, right? Intentionally, with precision, went to the cross for you and me. That God had stakes driven through his son's hands and feet. That he didn't hesitate to sacrifice his own son for you and me. This Lord's Supper is a call to remember that the Lord would not have anything like the old mama bear illustration. I don't know if I like it, but would not have anything come between you and him. And if it was there, he would do what it took. And so he gave Jesus so that you wouldn't be separated from his love ever. If you know Christ today, then you know the story and have accepted the, sto the story and live in that kind of security that there's nothing that separates you from the love of God because of what Jesus did. And you've confessed that and you believe that and you live that and you walk that. If you're a believer today and you're struggling with that, this meal is a spiritual, not only a mental, but a spiritual reminder of this. If you're not a believer today, there's still some interference in the story, right? There's some interference because you haven't come to Christ. So we urge you not to take this meal if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, as one who has come to soothe your heart, your motherless soul, if you will. But come, please come. If you're a believer today, and you hating your brother or sister <laughs> for whatever reason or hating daddy, the Lord. Scripture says don't come with that kind of heart, but repent and begin the work of reconciliation by the power of the Holy Spirit before you take this meal and it harden your heart against them and against the Lord. It's just taking a pause to let the Lord do his work in the proper order and proper way. The scripture says that Jesus took bread. You can open yours and take your bread out on top. And he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. The Bible says, after supper, he also took the cup. He says, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Drink from it, all of you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that because of Jesus, we need not live as a motherless child. Feeling far and lost, alone, far from home. Lord, I pray that you would draw your people near. Lord, that somehow by your grace, they would feel the embrace of your arms just like a child should his own mother. Let us know that and feel that, Lord, thank you that for our protection, for our care, that you will not hesitate to take out the enemies that are against us. We appreciate your intentional dynamic and precise love for us. Thank you, Lord, that you won the victory, but we get to wear your righteousness. Help us to celebrate and praise you in that. And then, Lord, to praise, to just say a word, to send a text, to send an email to those who have acted as mothers in our lives to celebrate to love on. And as we do it, let it be a picture of us praising and celebrating you for how you've loved us. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Please stand for our closing song today. There's a new song that we're going to introduce to you all today. Um, some of you may have heard it and some of you may not have, but it's okay. Um, it's simply a blessing. Um, and if you look through scripture, there's blessings throughout scripture for us. And so let this blessing be a reminder to you as you go through your week that the Lord is within you and he is with you that he's with you in the morning and the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing. He is for you. He is for you. Sing with us.
I think we can clap better than that, church. There we go. It's a hand clap for Jesus. What a great day to worship the King. What a, what a great day to worship the Lord. Um, today is Mother's Day, and to, to, to continue to celebrate mothers, this is a tradition that we haven't been able to do in the past two years, but the way we do it at Christ Central Church is we uh, honor all the women in our church. So whether you were born last night or many, many nights ago, if you're a woman in our church, we ask or we have flowers for you as you leave either one of the sanctuary doors. So as you go today and you continue to celebrate moms, we want to help celebrate with you guys. So grab a flower as you go. Hear this blessing from God's word as you go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Amen.